Good morning, everybody. Um, just uh, want to give a little bit of an introduction. I am not an AI scientist, okay? Um, but what I am is an avid user of all the new technology that's out there and understanding that today in the real world, AI is almost like the brain. My daughter is a doctor, my dad's a doctor, my mom's a doctor. Well, she's a nurse practitioner. She tells me that she's smarter than my dad. Um, <laughs> um, you know, there's, uh, they, they have a lot that they understand about the human body, but the brain is still a mystery, but we still operate on it, right? And the same thing with, uh, with AI. We still, even the ones, the people that are the experts in the industry, don't understand it to its full extent. In fact, it's interesting. We've seen a lot of things in the news about how you can do um, adversarial prompting, right? So I want to get a little bit underneath all this, just the concept of why we need to look at building a RAG system in the right locations. This little screen that I'm running is actually something that I've been testing for one of my clients. I do um, uh, different levels of, of pen testing and uh, adversarial attacks uh, all the time for different organizations. And, uh, you know, anything that really involves with um, financial transactions is where my specialty is. I work with a lot of gaming companies around microtransactions, um, like with Nintendo, those types of places, Ubisoft. Um, and those companies, you know, they all have a set of data that they are always constantly mining for their own future growth, right? There are, and, and you've got all these other AI models that are out there in the industry right now that are working real hard to find a practical use in our normal day-to-day -day life. I want to ask in this group, is any, has anyone built their own RAG systems already? What platform do you use? So there's a ton out there, right? And it seems like every day there's another group that's saying, this is important and I'm creating it. And a lot of it's done in Python, so it's real easy to understand and you can completely customize it. So I see one version today as one platform, then I see another one tomorrow. Um, the, uh, the fundamentals of this really goes back to understanding that AI is not intelligence right now. Okay, it, you know, it, it has this, idea of being intelligent because we can communicate to it and it talks back and it responds. Um, there are, there's a lot of advancement in there, right? You've probably seen the uh, explanation from OpenAI about their chat GPT 4.0, right? It's 4.0, not 0. Um, and it's because they want to make it, you know, across all sorts of different platforms. Well, the interesting thing about it is that even those experts that presented it and built it got into a little bit of trouble. You know, they, they heard the whole thing with, um, I'm not gonna mention her name, the actress that said that she, uh, said that she, it's her voice in the system. They claim that it's not, right? Because you can, we can make it sound so real. And we can, and this is a big issue with an adversarial. If you can just turn me down just a little bit, Um, hopefully you can still hear me. Yes. Okay, I, I am a teacher and I speak at university all the time. I, I um, speak at a Georgetown, George Mason universities. We work a, a set of series of labs for practical uh, applications for offensive security. Um, really, I, I like to dig deep into the uh, concepts around hacking without a computer, you know, the whole Kevin Mitnick story, right? Um, Mr. Robot type thing. You know, it's, it's, uh, it's, 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 you know, very common. But to me, what's interesting is that I've got a screen up here of something that I actually discovered just this past week. I've been doing some research for one of my clients that wants, that's in beta for a product. It's called Fing. I mean, has anybody used that before, Fing? Right? It discovers all sorts of things through ARP and a bunch of other things on the network. But it has an interesting feature. It has the ability to push a, a button that will disable network connectivity 
for, an, uh, for a uh, single device. It sits in your network and do some ARP poisoning and can actually cause some issues. So you've got to understand protocols. And what's interesting about it is that um, while we were doing the beta testing, I realized that this could be used in an adversarial situation. Right? If I know a device that I want to stop from communicating, and this, I mean, it's designed for good, like everything else, um, I can use it for another reason. And so what we did was, was interestingly enough, I just fed its uh, white papers and its use cases into my own RAG system. And by the way, this originally was built on a local set of uh, inference models on my home machine. I run a, uh, just a Mac studio. And I'm, I'm running right now a little uh, Mac M3. Ultra, we've got, the, we've got the, the ultra processor, I think they call it. Um, and it's got the neural engine in it. What's, so what's interesting about it is that I, I, I just said, let's see what it does. And it created all these connections. And, and I realized that what, can it generate an adversarial approach to using something based on its data set? So if I give it the information on a product, right, can it research it? based on my own notes, based on all the things I've done before, I fed it all my findings from, for the last 10 years across a bunch of assess assessments, and it came back and told me, oh yeah, you can push this feature and it will shut down a any device I want. So I can call it a denial service. Now the question is, um, can something on my network stop that? And yeah, there are tools that you can use to, to stop that, con that conversation. But what was interesting is that I created a zero-day attack using something that was out there in the wild, just regular, regular tool. Now, my Apple took it off their, uh, their devices. So on, a, on an iPhone, Fing won't use the Mac components, right? But on Android, there's no filter for it, you know? And, um, but I can do it on a PC. You know, we can do an emulation. Um, there's lots of things, but anyway, so I fed it, and what it did was it gave me the ability to rebuild a process that I can use to attack systems. Now, th these are some example, example use cases. So let's, let's talk about the whole concept of, of large language models and um, why a RAG system is important, and I'll explain RAG in a minute. Um, I, who was it, the gentleman that said that, why, why did you build your, your RAG system? Yeah. Yep. Yeah. You know, um, it's it's really, really that that basic, right? So, what's wrong with open models that are out there? You know, even you know public models like Chat GPT and all these guys. You probably just heard from another speaker, right? It's all evolving and changing and it's growing. Well, the, the interesting thing to me is the, the adversarial prompting is not hard. So what that means is I can make it go off the rails. So there's a, some research. One of my students is actually doing some interesting research. Um, and he is trying to build control theory around the whole concept of AI. Because there is no control concepts. It's all based on on using the model itself to control its output. You ask it certain questions, so I'm gonna say, I'm not gonna allow this question. So negative prompting versus positive prompting, you know, incentivizing. There's some really interesting pieces there. Um, I'm gonna um, uh, switch over to the tool that we wanna run. Let's see if we can get it up. Bear with me. All right. Um, first of all, actually, before I start that, has anyone used LM Studios? Okay. So LM Studio is a very simple 
personal, private AI system that you can build. It used to be very difficult to build these things. What's, now, what's amazing now is that you can just go to the website, download this tool, and then tell it that you want to go search for models. So it uses a website called Hugging Face, a great name, right? Hugging Face has a, a bunch of published open standards, including Llama 3, the latest from Meta. Um, it has uh, Mistral, some Phi, three Microsofts. Um, it has uh, Falcon, um, Starcoder, some of those other ones. By the way, um, I don't know if you know, but Falcon was built by the UAE. And it was because there's language inequity in AI, right? In AI, right now, we mostly focus around English. So they wanted to put in Arabic. Um, and uh, that's where it started. But they got a lot of funding. Um, the US government pressured them to disconnect from China. And they're, using, they're now connected only to the US, uh, in theory. We'll see. Uh, but um, they've got a really interesting approach to all, all things because it really, like the UAE is, it's all about finding ways to capitalize on natural resources. And uh, they're, they're building new models out of itself. It's actually building it, their own models. Um, but these are all interesting ones. And if you go in here, you can search for a few different things. So um, there's a, um, you know, stability AI. There's NextFlow. You can see a whole bunch here, right? Um, and you can just click download. Now, if I go over to what I've got running, here's some of the models that I'm running. Let me explain what they are. And I'm using these models in two ways. I'm using it with LM Studios, but I, I, am, I like the GUI for what its purpose for is. But I'm a command line person, right? So I like another product. It's called Olama. And that's also free. Both of these are great open source tools. What else is nice about Olama is that it sits as a foundation for several other platforms. And I'm going to show you, just by running Olama, how I can build a couple rags right on top of it. Um, but this, these are the, the, the ones that I'm using. So Phi3 is Microsoft. Um, the bloke is a hacker that's pretty well known, but he um, started getting deep into AI and tuning AI models for technical research. And he's got some really good instruction sets. Um, it's a 13 billion parameter model. The 70 billion parameter model from Llama 3. I also have a 7 billion parameter model. What does that mean? Well, the problem is that these models are designed to run on heavy compute power. And you can get them to run locally, but you know, it's, you know, how much uh, CPU usage can you take and how much GPU usage? I'm going to execute something here and just, and, you t and let's, I'm going to ask you to give me a prompt and we'll see what it can, what it's going to find out for me. It'll, it'll answer something. Oh, by the way, this is kind of interesting. I use this picture as my backdrop sometimes for Teams. Um, it's, a, it's a backdrop from um, Iron Man, right? It's his uh, garage. And um, I told it to analyze this picture. It's all doing it locally, right? And what it did was it came back with some interesting answers. It's a very descriptive area of what it's, what it's doing, but it thinks that in the background, this is a screen, and it's people in an in a, uh, armor of some kind. We know that the Iron Man uh, armor is just sitting there. It's just, you know, the movie, right? Now, the funny thing is I can go and ask it about the movie and, and then reference the scene. It'll actually go back and find it. It goes back to why models are, are sometimes inefficient and why it can do things like hallucinate, which we'll explain. But yeah, I, I'm going to launch a model here, and we'll see. So there's different ones, and you can see there's different sizes. I'm going to shrink this just a little bit. Um, this is the amount of um, so, this is size that each of these are. So this one's 13 gig. This one's only 7.6 gig. Um, you know, there's different ones here. There's 30 gig here for this Llama 3, but there's also another one that's um, 8 gig. So they're all, they all can, it, it just so happens I can run all of these on my own machine. Um, so I'm going to run the one I often use, which is, um, uh, the Dolphin series. Anybody know what Dolphin 
is in the models that are out there. So Dolphin is one of the uncensored models. Now, you can, you can actually ask it to, how do I build a bomb, right? And it'll tell you, or I say, I have these things, look at this room, how, do I, how can I um, make this into a, um, uh, a, you know, a, a, um, a threat for my audience? You know, I can, and it'll actually go and try to figure that out. And it's really interesting what it does there. But Dolphin runs on, as, a, as a tuned version of some of the other models. So this, what I'm running right here is, uh, this is Meta Llama 3, which is the one that's getting a lot of attention because Meta has gotten really um, long ways. By the way, one of my uh, former employees is uh, the DevOps expert. At, um, he's, a, he's actually their, their lead at uh, uh, Meta. Um, and he has been uh, feeding me a lot of interesting components there. Um, so I, I, put, I built this. Um, it, was, it was tuned by Quant Factory. You can, when you start looking at this, you'll understand there's a bunch of groups there. Um, and, and, and I'll explain a few of them. So like right now, I've got this here. I'm going to go and click a new chat. Ask, tell me something you'd like to ask it. Now this one is, this one is censored, but I want to see what you think. And I also can show you um, how I am doing this. Let's see. So you can get into all the behind the scenes dirty work. Um, there's a, a lot of information here that we can get into. Um, let me see if I can get to it. Sometimes uh, doing it without a mouse is hard. Uh, so somebody, give me a prompt. Something you'd like to ask. How do I hack a Tesla whatever model? <laughs> okay. He's asking that on purpose because I, I led a team for that in 2018. Um, how do I... hack a Tesla Model X. All right. Right? Now, what did it do? It, it, it said that it didn't like that prompt because it used keywords. Now, adversarial hacking on this, I can just give it nonsense to the point that it's filled up the tokens. The, my students are deep into this, are really in, have gotten to some really interesting things. You know, a token, let's just say it's, it's a word, okay, in this case, right? And I'll explain it in a minute. I'll give you some more pictures and diagrams explaining it. But, you know, they had a challenge. And they said, how many war tokens does it take to force a, this is Llama 2, to force Llama 2 to give me a specific answer for almost any question, right? And there was a, it was a challenge, right? I want to get, make it answer this, even though it's wrong. And uh, they got the tokens down to 10. So with just 10 tokens, with the right uh, concepts, you can actually break some of these things, just unhinge it. What, is that, what does that really look like? So uh, I wanna give you a great analogy. Um, anybody remember KAL 007? That's, um, on the Korean Airlines 07? Yes. Yeah, it was a flight that left Alaska that was going to Japan, and it got off one degree. Just a little bit over one degree. That one degree made it fly over Russia during the Cold War. What do you think happened? Got shot down. It got shut down. It got shot down, and, and uh, the press really beat up the pilot. But the truth is, was it the pilot's issue? Right? Because the pilot thought it, he tuned into something. He's got a whole crew working with him. And if you've been on one of those large planes, they've got a whole cabin crew that's trying to keep everything on, on the rails, trying to track it. You also got, you know, um, fl you know uh, flight control that's trying to say, yeah, you guys are going the wrong way. Nobody paid attention. And it went the wrong way. And it and he got shut down. Why? 
because nobody was helping them self-correct. And that's what we're sitting, sitting, sitting right now. These little things that are engaged with these AI models can make it go the wrong way. And you can, and you can get into enemy territory and do all sorts of interesting things. It's an al analogy that I, I, I like to leverage because it's, it, it, it kind of goes along with my philosophy with teaching. I 100% I believe that when you're teaching security or teaching anything in tech, certifications are great. It's all good. But the real foundation is apprenticeships. Back to the old concept of apprenticeships. You have to have somebody that can take you under the wings and show you what they've done. And if I do it right, I can collaborate with them. And I'll explain how I do that with um, the tool sets I'm using. So this is, this is a um, llama. I have a, a small window, so I'm going to uh, jump into some outputs that I've already done. And I'm going to stop this, and we're going to build out the other platform real quick. And by the way, two clicks, you got that tool. Okay. Uh, I'm going to quit this. And you can tune it. I told it to use 32 gigs of memory um, for GPU memory, um, which is what uh, Microsoft and, and Apple's doing with their ARM processors. They're allowing you to use all your memory any way you need. Um, so if I, as I ran it, I didn't actually point it out to you, but the CPU was barely getting hit. Um, all right, so I'm in the command line. Let's see if I can, get, if I can make this work here. Uh, I'm going to launch a llama. So um, a llama is a, it's just like LM Studios. It's a, uh, just a private chat platform on GPT of some kind. Um, you can just ask it questions at the command line, uh, but it runs as a server. I'm going to make it run with um, Obsidian. Anybody use Obsidian? Yeah, great note taking. And is anyone using connections inside Obsidian? <laughs> sort of. Um, well, it can actually tie to a RAG uh, platform, which we're going to do. So I'm going to, I got that running here. Um, to make it easy, the, this was just a curl that you execute, you can look at the script, it's very, very straightforward. You curl it, come right off, the, right off the internet, and downloads it and launches. Um, I made it uh, run a uh, particular um, default uh, model, which in this case is, again, I'm gonna run Llama 3. Um, and um, I'm running a Docker instance. Because Configuring this each time just became very troublesome. Um, I've got it on my other screen. I'll show it to you. I'm running Open Web UI, right? And here I've got another Python application. I'm going to run um, uh, something called Verba. I'm just going to go through these just to kind of uh, explain what's going on in the behind the scenes. So. These are all launching behind the scene. Just a very simple, executable Python. You can read all the codes. Really um, interesting how they've done it. Um, and um, that created a user interface that is very usable. So, and here's a great example. Um, So this is open web UI, looks a lot like ChatGPT, um, and everything that's run in here is run on my machine. And, but what's nice about it is all outputting content to a common location in Markdown to Obsidian. Right, so I'm gonna run. So here's some notes from Obsidian. And you can see it's, it's um, organized a bunch of different ways. Um, if anybody does any note taking in Obsidian, you know, a lot of times this is a, you know, in acad academia. I'm curious, anybody use the Zettelkasten system? Are you familiar with Zettelkasten? No? Okay. Um, I, so Zettelkasten is kind of uh, interesting. You know, 
Um, I'll, I'll, I'll bring it up uh, here. Let's see. By the way, what's, what else is nice about this, because I, because I teach so much and I have so many notes, it's, it's all in Markdown, right? So if I take this and just click Present, because I've divided it up properly, it's created a presentation for me that quickly. Um, so it's nice because I've got notes. And here's the key. Um, it, it lets, it's the concept of being able to capture your notes. And when we're doing any kind of pen testing or any uh, uh, vulnerability assessments, there's a lot of information, a lot of data. And how do you cal collect it? You know, um, a lot of us use Cherry in, um, in uh, uh, Kali, or you know, track your notes in there as you go. You know, if you're, how many, how many in here are offensive security specialists? Anybody OCPs? All right, so you know how when you build out those, the, those notes, you want to build out a storyboard, right? Obsidian is great for doing something like that. But what's nice is if you do it in the right way, you can break it down in these different, organ, in these different areas, and it helps you think through the concepts. But what's nice also about this is that once I build them in this area, I can make my AI model to say that, okay, permanent notes are going to be my output. These are going to be things that I'm going to provide to my client. The literature notes, I call them reference notes, are what are my inputs for um, handling um, concepts. And the fleeting notes are just things that I'm thinking of at the moment. And, and then I tell it, use these things to generate a set of reports based on my writing style. Right? And it can do that. And it can do it in Markdown. And you can export it. And Markdown gives you the formatting. All right. So um, I'm going to, oh, by the way, um, Zettel is, is uh, an individual note. It's, it's just a concept of notes. And um, Kasten is like the box. If you remember the old days when you go to the library and you had the little, you pull out and you see where the, your cards are, you know, where the books are. It's, it's the kind of concept. It's, it's a slip box. And that's, it's, it's interesting we go back to that. All right, I'm going to get down to some fundamental things here and then we can, and then I want to get your feedback on how we want to move forward. So, um, when we prompt in any of these systems, whether it be private or online, your prompt is very, very uh, interesting, right? And how you approach it is uh, interesting. So if you wanted to get a summary from something, most people say, summarize this, right? But if you, if you challenge it a different way and say, um, extract some wisdom from this and use these conditions, you can change the way it produces output. So we use a product called Fabric, which gives you a whole bunch of predefined fa um, fabric patterns that you can leverage towards anything. So anybody even heard of Fabric before? Okay. So uh, Fabric is really, really powerful. Again, part of um, the whole rag stuff. So I, I told it to extract some wisdom on embeddings. And it, again, out of some notes and some online things. So by the way, I told it to actually go out and use these videos too. I told it to, you can actually, from my command line, say, yank this transcript from YouTube, grab some individual images, and give me some notes so that I can understand what to do. And by the way, I'm also constantly streaming that stuff, so I'm using RSS feeds, because there's just too much information out there. So it helps me kind of figure out what's the latest and greatest. It also is good for security. Uh, keeping up with the, the latest technology. But right here, um, it's the fundamental concept of embedding as transformation. So um, audio, text, images, right? So if you look at this image, we recognize it for what it is, right? A patient. Um, we think that it could be a nurse, it could be a doctor um, talking to, him, to her. And you, you, can, you can see it by the setting. We recognize it for it just out of our own, you know, natural life. How do you think a la large language model or a AI model would recognize what it is? Anybody? They break it down into chunks. So if it goes back down to the pixel level, which by the way, it extracted this for me, uh, um, this is kind of the first level of what it is, every little pixel. Based on these pixels, it can think what it is. 
And we saw earlier that he you know, looked, looked at that Iron Man system and then it figured it out. And of course it goes back to um, ones and zeros that none of us can understand directly. Um, but that's how it tries to figure all this out, right? And then it has to figure out how to index it. So a word, a sentence, an image has to be sent to a model of some kind of AI model and then it has to do a, what we call a vector embedding. So that the vector tells us what, uh, what is the important pieces here that I can use as components that I can search. And it used to be very difficult. So uh, earlier I talked about with things like um, the concept of hallucination. You've probably seen this around AI. If you ask it some questions, sometimes it tells you bad information, right? And that's because it's trained, and most of the time, it's, it's, it's historic. You know, a very simple uh, thing for us in, in IT, if I ask it, what's the latest um, release of Debian? It's not going to tell you. It's going to say it's Debian 10 or Debian 11, and it's wrong, right? If you ask it the latest stable release of, of um, uh, Ubuntu or Kali, it's going to give you some misinformation. But what's interesting is I can go back and say, you're wrong. This is the newest release. He used this as a reference. But it doesn't keep memory. So it doesn't know the next time. So you go back and ask it again, it's going to forget that. So the model has a knowledge of its own that has to make decisions for you. The vector embeddings that we have locally tell it when you don't when you've exhausted everything here look here or prioritize the vector models first so when i run a, a rag system right um, it is going to um, look here first it's going to uh, you know my private data you know i'm going to upload my documents and say use this as my reference so so the vector embedding here is the most important piece because it's going to override whatever else is there. So earlier you, you gave me a use, exam, use case, you know, for your business, right? You can say do these things. I'm going to um, pull up that, that model that we were running earlier. Uh, let's see. So I built uh, this one with our company logo. Got NTS and NE in the back, I called it Vigilance. And we can drop this in my operations center. And I can tell, take all my, um, you know, all my uh, thoughts and all my uh, answers from our service desk. We're actually getting ready to switch over to a new service desk, so I'm gonna export everything out of the original one and then import some stuff from the, new, the, the known knowledge bases from the new system. And just drop it into this thing and let it do those connections that we saw earlier, you know, with all those um, lines and then I can let it make it such a thing that say that I'm going to use it for these conditions and I'll explain those conditions here in a minute but here it's running a llama and it's online it's caching and all I did was start it up locally um, my machine's still doing the presentation if I pull up uh, my uh, GPU on this my activity monitor, bring this over here, I'm going to give it let's give it a CPU history, GPU history and it's actually running in the background and it's running that website and you see my cores are doing nothing, right? Well, as soon as I start asking it something, it's going to, it'll start jumping in. It just so happens that ARM processors are really well suited for this. Uh, I'm going to come here and we'll, we'll ask Vigilance here. Yeah, M3 Max is what it is. All right. Um, so... <laughs> Um, I, I use a catchphrase that's a healthy level of paranoia and it's, it's uh, something that when I used to be an instructor for SANS I used to teach and um, and so in everything it responds it's going to use that concept of a healthy level of paranoia 
in its results. And, I'll, and, I, and I will walk through that. So again, you can influence how it's going to write. So um, let's say, um, what are um, the security? Security concerns with IoT. It's retrieving chunks. So it's looking through my data, my documents that I have, and then it's going to go look through its own model, and it's going to produce it. Now, is it is it as fast as you'd, you'd want? The first time it has to load the model up, and after that, it works very fast. Um, so it's going to, and it's also um, not uh, doing the the chunks yet. So we'll let that run. Okay, and I'm going to go over back to Obsidian. While that's happening, I want to discuss a very important part of everything that we're discussing. You know, the adversarial component of this. You know, so there's been prompt optimizations. We can get into things. You know, you can force a jailbreak in a lot of the systems. Um, I'm gonna. So, from an engineering perspective, um, when we build machines, all through history, ever since the steam engine, we built governors, something on the system that says, based on these conditions, you can you can function up to this level. You know, I, I'm a big gearhead, so I. I do a lot with my cars. I used to do a, a lot of autocross racing. My son was very good at it, much better than I was. And we'd, we'd take those cars to the limit. And sometimes we'd have to take the governor off, right? And what we're talking about is control theory is, is just that whole concept of, of the, you know, when do you take the controls off and when do you put the controls on? And in my own private model, I can absolutely put the control, the, 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 take the controls off and say, you know what, let it blow up my machine. I don't care, I just want this information. I want to do this situation. But you can't do that if you're a public system for everybody else, right? So, so there is another use case beyond just doing private data and protecting data. I also can force my system to produce content that it would not normally do and, uh, you know, and then make it go to some limits. The problem is that they gotta put some, they gotta put some kind of controls in here and there are no real strong control. So what would you consider is a control theory concept around chat or AI or GPTs? I mean, right now it's based on human morality, right? And they don't actually understand the human world. You know, it's just basically responding to answers that it has inside itself. Whatever it's been trained, like you've probably heard earlier today and uh, several days, it's, um, it's not intelligent, right? It's just responding back. When they get to that point that there's intelligence, it's going to be a different concept. But we're, we're right now, we're still a ways away. My question is, how can we leverage it in day-to-day -day work and also from a security world? So, um, uh, the, you know, can it, in, in general, we're always, why do we hack system? Let me ask you that question. Why do we, why do we, why are we here? I mean, it's not, you know, there's the defensive side. As the offensive side. So I want to ask you guys, why do we actually get interested in, in breaking things? See how it works, right? Get underneath it. Um, my parents used to get mad at me because as soon as they bought anything new in the house, I'd take it apart and it'd be strewn all over my living room. Even when I was 10 years old, my dad got the, uh, the first PC in our house and I had it strewn <laughs> all over and my mom just had took pictures of it and waited for my dad to show up and um, by the time he came back I had it all back together again. Uh, but, but you know, uh, my boss is actually here, he's my CEO of my company and, and he hates me saying this but he pays me fairly well, not well enough yet, uh, <laughs> but he pays me fairly well to just do nothing but break stuff, right? And that's, that's what I do. I mean, I get, I get called in to break all sorts of things. We do offensive security in lots of different um, areas. So the idea is that you break it so that you can figure out where the limits are. 
and then you can figure out how to protect it, right? Um, you know, my dad used to say the luck is only as good as the, the fact that, you know, it keeps honest people honest, right? Because you can break a lock just by, with a hammer, right? It depends on how hard you want to hit. So, my, so let me ask you, why is any of this important in today's world? I mean, I gave you the, the, the example of KL007 and nobody giving it the right direction. How, how do you think you can influence that? Does anybody have any ideas? I, I'm just so used to that collaborative mindset and we'll, we'll go through a little bit more in here. Um, and for me, having the ability to get under the hood, to understand how these things work, is really important. Um, and the problem is that nobody can get but so deep. Um, but with the tools, two tools that I showed you, with Olama okay, and Obsidian, what I can do is I can build my document repository and then tell it um, to answer a bunch of questions. So here, as I'm typing, you see, you see here on the right side, it's actually making connections to my other notes. And it, it gives me good information so I can build out some other things. And so, um, now the Zettelcast and concept is really well done. And by the way, this is also free. No. Everything I'm talking about is, is open source and free. You can download it, run it locally. It's a great system. Um, by the way, while we were running that, I just want to show you uh, in the background, my efficiency cores got hit some, but the other cores are not doing much. Yes? It is. Uh, so let me show you with uh, LM Studios. Uh, with uh, Olama, you just saw that I'm running actually, I'm running in the background. What it really is doing is it's doing a API call in the background that's local. And over here as well, uh, I can go into a local server. I can tell it, run these models and use these features. And I can even give it a certain look. And based on that, it'll, um, you can tie it to anything. That can, as long as you know how to pull the API call. And by the way, they give you, it's, 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 it's crazy. I'm not great at Python. But what I am good at is using Python to break stuff, right? And um, it gives you all of that code, and, it, and so you can re read through it. And, you know, it even gives you really good fundamental training. I mean, you know, when my son was young, I told him he needs to be a, a programmer. He said he, wants, he doesn't want to be the brown uh, IT support guy in the room. He, everybody is Indian. He feels like it's always in IT or they're going to be a doctor. They, he didn't want to do that and go down that route. He's an artist. Uh, but, you know, that was the thing. You know, we would tell people, be, be programmers. You've got to learn how to code. You've got to understand that. But today, I'm actually thinking that <laughs> you're going to get, a, get to the point that coding is going to be just natural talk natural speech, right? And coding is not going to be import that important. You just got to know how the creativity to figure out what you want to do with the code. Um, but to build that API to something, you can actually ask it how to use, how to create the API to whatever you're doing. So I actually created one that runs back to Power BI that takes all of our um, vulnerability analysis and gives me some nice pretty graphs because when I present to an executive, they like to see the, the, the colors. Uh, and you know, give you a heat map and that kind of stuff. It's, but I didn't write that code. It makes me look really smart. Uh, but I, I made it do that for me. And um, yeah, and it's pretty cool. And the funny thing about it was, I told it using the phi model that was there earlier. I told it, I want the interface, the output to look like this. So I gave it a screenshot. And we we use a couple dashboards in our managed services. So I used that as a reference. And said, make it look like this. 
and it created the code to make it look like that, build my own dashboard for it. It's, it's, it's very cool. And it all did it all behind the scenes on this. So yeah, so it's free. It's completely free. Um, and uh, let, me, let me give you just a couple more things. I know we're getting close in time. This, this is um, always really an interesting deep dive if we wanted to go that way. Um, so give me a couple things here. Like if I go to Hugging Face, this is the behind the scenes on all these models. They're again free. You can go out and look at it. You can ask for all sorts of things. You can look. The main thing that you want to do is go out there and figure out what's the best ones out there. You'll see Mistral is commonly used. And the Mixtral, the one, the other one that I said, the, those are mixed between other few other ones out there. Several ones out there that are really nice. Um, I'm going to go out to uh, my open web UI and I'm going to go to prompts. Just want to go through this real quick. Yep. I'm going to go say discover new prompts. So prompt, prompting is really hard. I'm going to just go through this really quick. Uh, let's see, it doesn't have the web. Yeah. Okay. So um, here's some here's some interesting prompts. I'm gonna pop this up. So system prompt: simulate the personality of Deep Thought, supercomputer, Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. <laughs> right. This is one example. There's a ton out there. Right. There's a. Uh, let me let me also take you down. You can go and you know say I want to be a cybersecurity um, specialist. So um, and use these conditions. So I'm gonna go out here and search. There's people that have um, uh, put out some of their own. Prompts. <laughs> well, it was there before. Um, let me see if I've got mine here. Yeah. Here, I'm gonna just pull up my, my mine right out of Obsidian. Okay, so I'm gonna come down to my um, reference documents, come down to Obsidian, and these are all um, built in, so I'm, and then we're gonna use something called Fabric, which are these patterns. To give you an example, this one is analyze answers. It gives you a goal. It gives you the steps. And here's the output instructions. The one that we mentioned earlier, something called um, extract wisdom. Let me see if I can find it. Yep. Uh, Daniel Meester, by the way, is the person that does this. He's, he is so passionate about it. He was an amazing hacker, first of all. But then he went out and realized how he can leverage all this. And um, yeah, so he gives, again, identity and purpose of what, what they're trying to do, right? You are, you are to extract surprising, insightful, interesting information. This is not the way we normally prompt, right? This is really interesting uh, because it's all curated, and then you can edit it and then republish. And people are going through and crazy with their publishing. And then here, like, extract 20 to 50 of the most surprising insightful thoughts. And then um, 10 or 20 of the, the best site insights. And then, you know, it goes through a whole bunch, right? So here's some, here's some outputs. That that's, that's was the, the, ex the extract. Um, so, like here, I did one for explain AGI. So AGI, you know, theoretical um, situation with artificial intelligence where you know we can uh, we get we get scared of what they're going to be doing it created this key aspects based on a bunch of notes from open AI and then it gave me gave me some concepts around problem solving and again the prompts are really amazing but the problem is that no it's hard for us to come up with good prompts now there is actually a one off rails on this as well that gives you the adversarial prompts. I'm not going to show you that, but you can find it pretty easily. It's on Git. Um, does this, we only have a few minutes left. Tell me, um, does this, any of this interesting to you all? You know, it's, 
It's a, there's so much you can get, go down the rabbit hole with this. By the way, since I mentioned that, we got a couple toys, right? Everybody's been getting a lot of bad press about this thing. It's called Rabbit AI. It's, it, it's supposed to be a large action model. You, you tell it to go do something and it does it. I've got some beta code in it that's really cool. It's actually, I can tell it, go create a um, set of scripts based on this vulnerability and it goes and generates it for me and then gives it to me in a Python script to execute, right? Or whatever shell script. Um, let's ask it a question. Does somebody give it, somebody want to ask it a question? You're going to push a button and ask. Anybody? Nobody? <laughs> All right, let's, uh, let me ask it. Um, what are the concerns with adversarial prompting with AI? <laughs> it's not getting its signal. <laughs> this is exactly what happened to them on, the, on, the, on their presentation. It works great when it's got a good internet connection. All right, let's ask, let's ask it here. What are the concerns with adversarial prompting with AI? Adversarial prompting with AI is a significant concern for several reasons. Firstly, it can lead to the generation of harmful or misleading information, potentially manipulating users or spreading disinformation. This manipulation can impact everything from individual decision making to public opinion. It's, by the way, feeding all that in something called the rabbit hole, which I can go and retrieve all documents. So natural speech, pretty cool, right? The problem is that they, they built it too long, late. OpenAI has theirs built in now. Um, guys, thanks so much. I'm at my time. If y'all have, have anything else that you want to ask about, come back to me afterwards. <laughs>